Continuing with chapter six, we're gonna discuss standardizing data. What standardizing data is, is it's really just using the standard deviation as a ruler. So, can we compare apples and oranges? In most cliche moments, no, you cannot. But, if we use the standard deviation as a measure, then we can absolutely compare apples and oranges. Using standard deviation to compare data with different units is called standardizing. Basically, standardizing data gets rid of the units you were previously using and uses standard deviation instead. So, standardizing with the z-scores. We compare individual data values to their mean relative to their standard deviation. So, by standardizing data, you're actually calculating a z-score. z equals x minus the mean over s, as we can see in this equation here. z represents your z-score. X is your observed data value, X with the bar over it, X bar is your mean, and S is going to stand for standard deviation. Again, we call the resulting values standardized values, noted as Z, because it's representing our Z score. So what a Z score does is it indicates how far you are above or below the mean. So Z scores, which are standardized values, have no units. Essentially, you're using standard deviations as your units, but a z-score is considered unitless. Z-scores measure the distance of each data value from the mean in terms of standard deviations. A negative z-score tells you that you are below the mean, while a positive z-score tells you that you are above the mean. Whether or not that is good or bad depends on the context of the situation. So, for example, a z-score of negative 2 tells you that you are two standard deviations below the mean. A z-score of 1.6 tells you you are 1.6 standard deviations above the mean. The further you are from the mean, the greater your z-score. For example, we're going to compare apples and oranges. You go out, you buy an apple and an orange, and both weigh 12 ounces. The mean weight for apples is 8 ounces with a standard deviation of 2, and the mean weight for oranges is 10.5 ounces with a standard deviation of, of, of 1.5. So we want to know which one is bigger. So despite the fact that they both weigh the same amount, because apples and oranges tend to be different in size, we could consider one of them to be bigger than the other when we're comparing them. The way that we're going to do that is to standardize the data by calculating a z-score. That'll tell us how far above or below the mean is for each fruit, and then we can compare them to see which one is actually bigger. So that's what we did here. We calculated the z-score for the apple on top. Remember that the equation is your data value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Our observed weight was 12 ounces minus our mean of 8 ounces divided by our standard deviation of 2. So this ends up giving us a z-score of 2, meaning that the apple is 2 standard deviations above its mean. Then we calculated the z-score for the orange, again using the same equation, your data value minus the mean over the standard deviation. This gives us our observed weight of 12 minus the mean of 10.5 divided by the standard deviation of 1.5, which gives us a z-score of 1. Now in this case, the orange is only one standard deviation above the mean. Because the apple is further from its mean than the orange is, in this case we would consider the apple to be bigger when you are comparing them. Obviously, if they were sitting side by side, they would be the same because they weigh the same amount. Now, if you paid the same price for each, which one would have given you the better deal? Because the apple is further from its mean, you're getting the better deal for the apple than you are for the orange. So, how does standardizing affect distribution? Well, standardizing data will shift by the mean because you're subtracting the mean so it's going to move it down to the mean and then it rescales it by the standard deviation because you're dividing by the standard deviation that is rescaling. So standardizing the, into z-scores does not change the shape. The, the shape remains the same. Now I actually want to point out here that 
if your data were skewed, it will still be skewed if it is standardized. If it's symmetric, it will still be symmetric when you standardize. Now the reason that I'm pointing this out is because we're going to eventually be talking about normal data. And we standardize a lot using the normal model. And I just want to point out here that you do not have to have what is considered normal data to be able to standardize and calculate z-scores. It can have any kind of distribution and you can still calculate a z-score. What it does do though is it will make the center become zero and it'll turn the standard deviation into one. Alright, let's talk about how big z-scores can get. A z-score tells us how unusual a value is because it tells us how far it is from the mean. So the further away you are from your mean, the further you are from the center, and the more unusual you're going to be. So a data value that has the same value as the mean has a z-score of zero. It's not any different. That's actually normally kind of boring. A larger z-score, whether it's positive or negative, is going to be more unusual, again because it's further away from the mean. Again, a positive z-score just tells you that you're above the mean, a negative just tells you that you are below the mean. For symmetric data, at least 50% have a z-score between negative 1 and 1, or we would say that they are within one standard deviation. No matter what the shape of the data, a z-score of 3 is going to be unusual, a z-score of 6 or 7 screams for attention and is most likely a mistake somewhere. That typically doesn't happen. So let's look at an example of using standardizing. So the college you want to go to tells you that the middle 50%, now remember the middle 50%, that would be your IQR, of the students have a combined SAT score between 1530 and 1850. Now, if this is our IQR, that means that 1530 is our Q1 and 1850 is our Q3. So you want to make sure that you're in the top 25%. So to be in the top 25%, that's 75% and above. So you would have to have a score of at least 1850 here. But you only took the ACT. Okay, so now, that, now we have a problem because this is a completely different test. So you want to know what your ACT score needs to be to be sure that you are in the top 25%. Alright, so this is where standardizing comes in handy because before we really can't compare ACT and SAT. But now, because we can standardize the data and get rid of the units that they were previously using, we actually can compare that. So we're told that the mean SAT score is 1,500 with a standard deviation of 250, and the mean ACT score is 20.8 with a standard deviation of 4.8. So we're going to need that. So the first thing that we have to do in this problem is determine how far above the mean you are to be in the top 25%. So remember you have to have a score of at least 1850. So that would be our observed score. Then we'd use our mean of 1500 and our standard deviation of 250. That will calculate our z-score and tell us how far above the mean we're going to have to be. And then we can use that to help calculate our ACT score. So let's go ahead and calculate the z-score for the SAT first. So here, doing out the calculation, so we have our observed score minus our mean divided by our standard deviation gives us a z-score of 1.4. So in order to be in the top 25%, you have to be 1.4 standard deviations above the mean. So that means that on the ACT, you also have to be 1.4 standard deviations above the mean. So we're going to use our z-score equation, but this time instead of calculating the z-score, we're actually going to use the z-score of 1.4 to calculate our observed data value, our x. So doing that, we have that, so our again, we want to be 1.4 standard deviations above the mean, so that's our z-score. We're trying to calculate the observed score that we would need to get. We subtract the known mean and the divide by the standard deviation. 
and then using algebra, I know you have to use algebra, uh, we can multiply by 4.8 and then add 20.8, and we get that our ACT score has to be 27.52. Now, ACT scores don't do halves, so we would have to have about a score of 28 in order to make sure that we're in the top 25%. Okay, so that is the end of the lesson for today. We're going to continue discussing standardized data tomorrow in class. So I will see you guys then. Have a great night.